there is a schema that we call defectiveness. This is very hard to change as a schema. You know, this is the, fa the famous imposter syndrome. Okay, most of the people that I see are doing very well in life somewhere. Okay, and uh, but many of them, and I would say for a big part of my life, including myself, had that imposter syndrome. You know, it's like everything goes well, people around you tell you are a successful person and things like that, but you have this feeling, you know, that. Mm, there may be something that could happen and you would lose everything. You know, it's like, uh, 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 this is the famous, and I have seen also some famous people in my society, you know, I mean, very known people. And sometimes so much people that I admire and things like that. And tr just discovering that some of them have this imposter syndrome, okay? So this is very hard to change. And I've seen lately people changing that schema and i've never before i would have say that most of your chains are coping with the schema but now i'm convinced that it's possible to change the schema So hello and welcome. Um, Vincent Ryan is my name. I'm a psychotherapist based in Cork in Ireland. And um, today's interview is a part of a series of interviews that we're doing with experiential uh, therapists and therapists who are very informed by experiential ways of thinking and working with clients. Um, so today I'm joined by Pierre Cousineau, um, who's a clinical psychologist uh, based in Montreal in Canada. So Pierre has been a practicing clinical psychologist since 1975, so a world of experience to draw on here today. Uh, Pierre is an advanced schema therapist and supervisor. Um, he's also an associate instructor with the Coherence Psychology Institute. Um, so you're very, very welcome, Pierre. Um, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, very, very happy to be, uh, to, to be in this uh, meeting today, this interview. Great. So, you know, 1975, gosh, you know, um, tell us um, maybe first of all, a little bit about, you know, kind of, you know, your evolution, uh, Pierre, if you don't mind, like just what was it like back in 1975 training and doing your own work and then what you've kind of like what you've experienced and how that's developed for you over the years, if you don't mind. No, it will be a pleasure. So uh, in 1975, at least in Montreal, where, where I was, uh, there were at that point uh, three main, uh, let's say, three main school of psychotherapy, which was uh, psychoanalysis and uh, traditional psychoanalysis, Freudian, okay, not like COVID or things like that at that time, Freudian psychoanalysis. There was a behavioral uh, therapy that was uh, somewhere, uh, uh, it was a new approach from what I was knowing at that time. And that was somewhere uh, in, in uh, how, how would I say, polarizing with psychoanalysis at the time, you know? Uh, so it was really, we don't have to go in the past and things like that. And also there's, there's, there was the Rogerian school, uh, which in Montreal was also important at the time. So uh, like I say very often, uh, I cannot make choice. So, <laughs> so I was in, a, in, a, in every school somewhere. So as a person, uh, uh, on the personal uh, side, I was uh, in psych personal psychoanalysis. At the time, it was nearly... Uh, Every, there was a lot of therapists in psychoanalysis. It was a kind of a culture that it was important to, to be in psychoanalysis. And, but at the same time, I was uh, working in labs uh, uh, because I, I was in search of, quote, truth, the truth. <laughs> and so I says maybe science is also very important. Uh, and uh, so I even did my master degree uh, working with rats in, sk in Skinner boxes and things like that, heart rate uh, measure and things like that, and going on the couch also <laughs> in psychoanalysis. 
And uh, so, and I was also in this French speaking culture. Then I, I, I went to, for my PhD, always in the same, uh, let, let's say in the same mind, mindset of the truth. So I says I went, there was a, a researcher who was doing, a, a, his name was Fence, and he was doing research on people um, where, uh, how, how do you say that? You know, you, you go in a, in a plane and then there's a parachute like you... Uh, how do you say that? Uh, people who, who jump from planes with. Um, um, I, I guess parachutist. I'm not sure. Yeah, parachutist. Yeah. Okay. So this guy was doing uh, research on that and, uh, and he was taking a physiological measure. And I said, oh, that's interesting because you get uh, personal experience very, very, very intense and you get measures. And he was talking about coping mechanism uh, with the stress and things like that. And I said, this is the way maybe we could measure a defense mechanism, you know, experientially uh, in an experiment and things like that. So th this was the issue at the time was this, this dream of finding uh, an integrative theory, which could talk about psychoanalysis and experimental psychology, neurosciences and everything. And then I met um, Donald Meichenbaum, who was a very important uh, CBT uh, clinician and theorist at the time. And uh, it was a new, uh, it's like for me coming from this psychoanalytic and French speaking <laughs> area, or uh, it, it was a new world. It was American psychology somewhere. And so uh, also I decided at the time that I would become a clinician. So I, uh, I, I stopped my dream of becoming an ex experimenter. And, uh, and so in all my career, it has always been that integrative uh, preoccupation, you know, about experience, neurosciences, uh, measures and things like that. And it's why it brings me to uh, around 1992, where I read a book by Jeffrey Young uh, on schema therapy. And this was a very turning point, tipping point in my career somewhere, because uh, Jeffrey Young was, uh, he was from the Beck School. He, he has been one of uh, the, uh, the person working with Aaron Beck on this research on cognitive therapy. But when he started working as a clinician in New York, he realized that it was very difficult with certain patients, borderline, for example, <laughs> to use cognitive, pure cognitive therapy. And so uh, he says it about his personal experience with he went for a gestalt therapy and things like that. And then he incorporated experiential work uh, to uh, his work with schemas. And this is where my career really took an, a turning point because I, I became a schema therapist. Uh, I have known personally Jeffrey Young and uh, it had a very important impact because it was like you could, leave, you could use cognitive, behavioral, experiential, uh, relational uh, techniques in order to make change. And also it was somewhere it's like the person was becoming uh, more integrated with all its aspects, like uh, affects and uh, and uh, cognition, cognition and everything. So that's what that was the point. And maybe uh, adding to that, a few years after, I started meditation uh, on a very regular basis. Since twenty years, I'm meditating nearly every day. And then I discover another thing, <laughs> very important on an, uh, as an experience, is that I would say feeling is like everything. <laughs> it's like in life, what we're doing is somewhat dealing with our feelings, cognitions. Cognition somewhere is very often a, a trailer to what we're feeling, okay? Like coherence, cognition is very a coherent, putting a verbal coherence of what we're feeling. And so uh, I noticed that working directly with what we feel was a very interesting pathway to change and more, more di direct pathway to change somewhere. 
So, and then I discovered a few years after uh, coherence therapy, which wasn't called coherence therapy at the time. <laughs> I discovered Bruce Ecker and uh, in his uh, first book, Deft Oriented uh, Short-Term Psychotherapy. And when I read this, that, that book, I said, oh my gosh, this is it. This is the thing that is missing in my work, you know, so, so something to change memory. Uh, in order to intervene directly on memory. But when I read this book the first time, I said, oh, this is a master. I won't be able to you know, replicate what he's doing until his, uh, his other book, which is uh, Unlocking the Emotional Brain, uh, which so that finally I integrated uh, memory reconsolidation to schema therapy. And in a way to try, because when you work with schemas, for example, abandonment, we call it abandonment schema. Uh, it means that people who have that schema are very sensitive to every cue that could predict that you will be abandoned. You're, or when you are abandoned, you, you find in a panic, desperate uh, uh, state, emotional state. And so now where I am is that with schemas, which are kind of, you know, memory, semantic, uh, uh, Bruce Ecker called, that, called them semantic memory, rules about how the, the world is or other people are, uh, are, are, are they behaving, are they reacting to things? So it's like I said, there's two things you could do. You could either be, uh, help somebody to cope with its schemas or what would be the nicest thing is change the schema <laughs> and it's like uh, Bruce Ecker make me believe that it's possible to change schemas so it's where I am right now <laughs> in yeah. terms of this and also I will add also my interest in neurosciences uh, I have said since many years that psychotherapy the 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 key to psychotherapy is working with memory especially emotional memory and that you have to know how memory works in order to uh, somewhere you utilize it in psychotherapy so it's it's all my i would say my scientific and experiential parts have come together with the question of knowing how memory works and how can you in your practice uh, knowing how memory works, use what you're doing in your practice to change memory. So that's where I am right now. Could you say a bit more about how you work experientially with therapists, sorry, with clients as a therapist with, with say memories of painful feelings or, you know, happy feelings or memories of those like is that a big part of how you work with clients? Yeah, clients? sure, sure, sure. So, so the way I work with it, it's it's about I come back to this question of memory, okay? So what, what is important and what is something we discovered, uh, I say we because I work a lot with Sophie Cote, which is a psychologist from Quebec City. We wrote a book on memory or consolidation lately. And uh, we kind of discovered together and Bruce Hecker was already, already, already knowing about this, that uh, somewhere, uh, I'm losing it just a second. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, yeah. When we have a memory of, of, of uh, for example, of an, an event that was very unpleasant, okay? So there is, this is one thing. When you, mem uh, when you memorize or you, you use imagery to, to get back in that experience, this is unpleasant, okay? And... What I would say, it will always remain unpleasant if it was, okay? This is not the point of psychotherapy, unless the person is unable to be in contact with that souvenir, which is traumatic memory. Then you have to work in order for the person to be able to integrate that memory, okay? But uh, since I'm not a specialist of traumatic memory, usually I work with uh, those, what I, I'll call those unpleasant memories. <laughs> Okay, so what what uh, what is the what, what do we have to do as therapists? The problem is not having 
an unpleasant memory because it will always remain an unpleasant memory. The problem is that what is the rule that you that you uh, retain from that unpleasant memory or those unpleasant memory? For example, when I am sad, there's nobody for me to listen to me or to be with me or to be compassionate with me, for example. Okay, that's a rule. That's a prediction. This is where psychotherapy has to go, not on the on, not on the souvenir. So then you have a lot of options. How can you change a rule? Okay, there are many options. So many therapies somewhere get in there and trying to change those rules. Okay. I use memory reconciliation as uh, used by Bruce Ecker, like in coherence therapy. This is one way to do this, okay? Uh, uh, we could go in details uh, after, afterwards, but, or but for example, sometimes we use uh, in, in uh, schema therapy, we use uh, imagery in a scene that was uh, with a certain scenario, okay? For example, if I take my example that uh, when I'm sad, there's nobody for me, nobody will listen to me, okay? Very often, there is a, this technique we use in schema therapy. We ask the person to reintroduce a, a, a recent scene, for example, with somebody. And then when the person is in the scene, we ask if she feels it, okay? And then we ask where, I ask, where do you feel it in your body? Okay, this is one point a question of body uh, in terms of experience. And then I say, okay, if you like uh, many, many therapies use that technique. I say, okay, so if you go in the past, okay, where is your oldest souvenir of feeling exactly as you feel right now? Okay, very often you get a scene with a parrot. Okay, so what we do, uh, like what I try to do, is, since I want to change the rule, what do I do? I, I take the scene and, for example, I may ask the person, could you ask to your mother or father or tell them what, how do you feel about them not being, uh, not being uh, listening to you or something like that, for example, okay? And the point here is try to change the experience, to try to validate that need of being listened to, okay? The parent didn't listen to, so didn't listen. So you won't change what happened. So you won't change the episodic memory. But what you want to change is your kind of rapport with that memory. Okay? Are you uh, are you a person who uh, you know it has a legitimacy to expect that from another person? That's the rule you want to change. Okay. So I will always work in terms of trying techniques to in order to change the rule, for example. So I may say to the person, uh, okay, now you will tell your mother, for example, you will tell your mother what you would have expected, what you would have liked to get from her, for example, okay? And when the person does that, I may stop there after I says, how, how did you feel when you asked this, okay? Did you feel that it was legitimate? Did you feel, uh, I mean, uh, it was, uh, you had the right to receive this or not or things like that. So this is a way, uh, for example, using a schema therapy uh, technique that, and my goal always is I want to change the rule. Did it change the rule or not? Okay. If it didn't change the rule, then I'll have to find another way, another path in order to try to change to change the rule of the memory somewhere. Yeah, and I suppose <clears throat> as, as you say that, I'm thinking about the rule is kind of ends up being something about sense of self. Um, like I'm not the kind of person who can feel my feelings, feel like I need to be comforted. That's maybe what the person's carrying, but mm -hmm. then you're helping them to, to, to change that sense of self and the rule around, well, actually I can be somebody who can, regardless of whether the parent or the other person responds, I can, I, there's a validity to me saying, yeah, you know, what I'd like is you to care about me or care about my feelings. And mm -hmm. that's, that's changing this. I guess that's changing the schema then is, is it about exactly, self, exactly. Self and other. Uh, exactly. 
This is one one uh, uh, when I work, I will say there is uh, rules about the self, rules about others, and rules about the world. Mm. Yeah. So this is an example of rules about the self. Is it legitimate for me? You know, for example, to and sometimes you have surprise. You know, uh, in 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 schema therapy, if the patient isn't able to uh, at first uh, for for many reasons, uh, like especially with pre- people who have been traumatized, coming from you know neglected from very uh, disorganized family, sometimes they they don't even know that this this exists that you could ask something or things like that. And sometimes, for example, we propose to talk for them. Would you accept me? To, would you accept that I talk, you know, I talk to your parent? And if you do that, for example, the, the, the point is always to check. After you did that, you ask the person, how was it for you when I was saying that to your parents? And I remember, sometimes you get surprised. I remember one patient saying to me, she, she her, her her expression, her gaze is totally changed. Now I know this is usually when you get the unmatching experience. I didn't know at the time, but <laughs> she was looking at me and she says, wow, this is the first time in my life that somebody, you know, protects me. It has never happened before. We oh, see. So sometimes you get surprised because it wasn't my goal <laughs> when I was doing the, the, the intervention. But this time, uh, and when you work experientially, that's that's the point. Usually you 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 have more chance to get something, you know, even if it's not what you were aiming at. Sometimes because there's there's thing going on in the system somewhere, sometimes you get surprised like this. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's one of the things that you like about working experientially is the surprise. And and um, I get the sense as you talk about it, it's very um, rewarding and enriching for you as a therapist to, to work in this way with your clients and your and the therapists you work with. Would that be true? Uh, oh, I would say more, uh, more than that, Vincent, I would add that when I discovered this, I says, oh, my God. You know, this is the, uh, the oh, this has the philosoph- philosophical rock or something. There is something about, you know, the, I says, this is wow. Because for many years, I, I had no clue, to be honest, <laughs> on how to change schemas. And very often when I was giving workshop on schemas, people were asking me, and this has been a question going along in schema therapy for many years, is it possible to change a schema? Or can you just cope with the schema, you know? Somewhere, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, with which I work a little bit also, is kind of, was kind of saying that you cannot change. So you have to, you know, uh, have a kind of a position like in meditation somewhere, you know, and, 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 feel, uh, and feel that, you know, uh, your intention is going this way, but you could, if, if you have a certain distance about it, you could say, no, I won't do it. Okay. Uh, uh, like uh, I have this impulse to say something, but I can't stop myself, but the schema is still there. I still feel it. Okay. And the question for many years, but is it possible? And when I was giving workshop, people were asking me and I was always, you know, answering says, well, you know, uh, I think you can change it, but I had no real clue about, you know, a direct way to try to, you know, to do it. Sometimes you got it, like I gave example of this intervention where the person felt for the first time of, of, his, of her life protected or somewhere, but it was kind of a fluke, you know, it wasn't my, <laughs> it wasn't my intervention somewhere. And uh, somewhere knowing that it is possible to change schema with this notion of memory reconsolidation was wow it's why i was so amazed and uh, when i read depth oriented uh, short term therapy for, for at that time i says it's possible but i'm not able to do it but <laughs> but now i have the feeling i can do it and this is what happens not every time, but it's, this happened um, very uh, more often than it 
very more often than it used to be before. So it's no, it's it's it's, it's you you are right. It's a joy, you know. It's like <gasps> when when you see the, those kind of transformation. This this I will always said it's the dreams of psychotherapists, you know, that the person says I I I and I understand now that changing memory change perception. The the last uh, knowing in neurosciences don't make difference between somewhere memory and perception. Okay in terms of what you perceive is somewhere through your memory, okay? Like schemas, even cognitive schemas are somewhere memories, okay? Of how you, uh, you have learned the way the world functions and things like that. Mark Stone says in his book that the, the visual uh, signal that you get in your eye is only responsible for 10% of your perception. The rest is memory. I want just to um, just inquire, you know, in terms of that that experience with clients of this transformational change mm. in your in your own experience uh, with with working with therapists and so on. Did you ever discover that for yourself where a schema wasn't just being kind of coped with better, but it kind of shifted for you in a dramatic way? Would that be something? Yeah. That, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, I noticed that with, uh, for example, working with uh, coherence therapy, for example, uh, there has been shift in myself also very important uh, and uh, I've seen also also since I worked since so many years I had patients who came you know they came for two years then they stopped and they came for and then lately in the last few years I have, I have a few who came back you know that I have been knowing for years and we succeeded to, to in order that's a good answer to your question we succeeded to change schema which we, even if they told me that I helped them, I guess so, because they come, they were coming back. So I guess so. This is like my family would say practical. They were coming back. <laughs> my father would say, my father would say to me, do they pay that much just to talk? That was the, that was the thing in my family <laughs> about psychotherapy. <laughs> and so um, this patient, uh, now I've seen some that, for some reason, for example, there is a schema that we call defectiveness. This is very hard to change as a schema. You know, this is the, fa the famous imposter syndrome, okay? Most of the people that I see are doing very well in life somewhere, okay? And, uh, but many of them, and I would say for a big part of my life, including myself, and that imposter syndrome, you know, it's like, Everything goes well. People around you tell you are a successful person and things like that. But you have this feeling, you know, that mm, there may be something that could happen and you would lose everything. You know, it's like uh, uh, this is the famous. And, and I have seen also some famous people in my society, you know, I mean, very known people. And sometimes so much people that I admire and things like that. And tr just discovering that, some of them have this imposter syndrome, okay? So this is very hard to change. And I've seen lately people changing that schema. And I've never, before I would have said that most of your chains are coping with the schema, but now I'm convinced that it's possible to change the schema. And, you know, I'd love to hear more. Can you think of a client, obviously protecting confidentiality and, and so yeah, on. Yeah. Your client or two, even an amalgam of two clients that you can think of now, Pierre, where that scheme at that that the imposter syndrome, the defectiveness scheme, mm -hmm. where that can you can you think of a of a case uh, where somebody they, they, they had a change in their schema around that? Is there somebody in your mind that okay. you can kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. let's give an example. Yeah. Guys, if you kind of details to protect the person's somebody would say to you, I'm a bad person. OK, he says, OK, why are you a bad person? Because, uh, you know, I can get angry very easily. Uh, and uh, when uh, when I was a parent, uh, sometime, you know, I could yell at my children or things like that. OK, it means I'm a bad person. OK. And so uh, uh, wh what we did with this and, uh, uh, for example, in coherence therapy, 
uh, we use very often what we call overt statement. This is very potential, okay? This is very potent, okay? Because first, and this is the thing about language, because I, I uh, uh, earlier I said the language is like of a coherence, but somewhere it's also important, okay? Like using, use the language this way. Uh, my understanding of it, for example, you, you have a kind of a rule, but this rule is implicit and you just run on it or somewhere. But when you take the rule and you just, um, you have an overt statement about that rule. For example, I am a bad person because I yelled at my children. Okay. And then we call that the, the, the sonar. When you say that in a conscious way, you are in your working memory or attention span, conscious attention span, then your memory makes links with other things. Well, my father was yelling at me. Oh, and sometimes my wife was yelling also. Okay. So, oh, I'm not alone yelling. And then you could use something like, and is your father a bad person? Okay. 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 It could, it, it's not, it's not a, a certain technique, but if the person said, no, I don't think my father was a bad person. Okay. This is an example of a shift. Okay. That could happen. Okay. The person somewhere sees other pe people that are not perfect to have been sometime angry uh, in, in a way that after that, they don't, they're not uh, uh, agreeing with what they, they have done and things like that. Okay. But that would be an example of uh, th this is where coherence, cognitive coherence has an importance, okay? Two different things cannot be true at the same time. In order one to be true, the one has to be implicit and the other one explicit, okay? This is the thing that we do in coherence therapy. We put the two things explicitly together. So if my father is not a bad person, and if it's sincere that I don't think he's a bad person, okay? Then somewhere why would I be a bad person? Okay. And it is a, this is the juxtaposition in, uh, in coherence therapy. This is just not, the, the, there's something that has to be, you know, that has, is not working in this thing. This is an example of, uh, I would say, working with the schema, for example. Okay. And so the person then is experiencing themselves as well. I can't simply be bad if all this is what we're saying because their, the father, their father wasn't bad. So it doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah, for example, uh, uh, the, in the case of that patient, the father was dead, uh, already deceased, okay? And the person, the, 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 the integration she had of, uh, of her father uh, was that uh, her father uh, was, um, uh, was uh, she, she, she is in peace with her father. He, he has this side, he had other side and things like that. And so she, could, she couldn't uh, uh, just uh, put it in one way, like, uh, you know, uh, my, uh, uh, my, uh, my father is a bad person, you know, this, this kind of uh, compacting about the person and things like that. So this, this, and the thing about this is that you have to be, to become very creative about what kind of experience you will try to find <laughs> in order to, to, for the person to realize that the rule isn't true anymore, okay? Or uh, that rule doesn't fit the reality, uh, the, the old reality or something like that. And I had this experience, as a matter of fact, before I've known, I give, we give that experience in our book, and this is a true experience. That was my first contact with unmatching experience. I had that patient, and this was a question for me, because she was feeling that I thought that she was not an interesting person. So she was predicting that every time she would be coming to, to see me, uh, I would uh, be, I would look and say, oh, no, not her. Oh, yo, yo, I, I'll, I will have an hour with her. She's so annoying and, da, 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 and this and that. Okay. And a thing I didn't understand since I didn't feel that, that was not my feeling at all. You know, I was happy to see her and things like that. Okay. And I was questioning myself, how come my experience doesn't change hers? Mm. 
Okay, that was a question I had about, you know, this contradictory experience that we, we read about. I says, how come this isn't a contradictory experience? Okay, then this thing happened, a, a, a lucky thing one day. Uh, she told me that she was going to get married. It, I knew it was very significant and important for her. And she told me she was looking to find a, a, a dress for her marriage. Okay, she told me that through many things. And a few sessions after, the session is over, we are, because uh, uh, my, my office is in my home, and I, after a session, I go back in my home somewhere. <laughs> and uh, we are, both of us are in the waiting room. We are alone. There's no, nobody waiting. And then it comes to my mind, this question of the dress. I says, oh, my, oh, did you find your dress? By the way, did you find your dress? Okay. And she said, yes. He said, okay, and what is it like? Uh, are you happy? Uh, okay. And then a few sessions after, she told me that I asked her something about, you know, how she felt uh, in, uh, with me and things like that. I don't know what was the moment. And she, uh, she said, oh, what I was feeling before, I don't feel it anymore. I said, oh, my gosh. I'll come. And then she, she tells me that story. Okay. And now I, it's easy to understand with how memory works. What does she predict when she comes to see me, even if I'm nice? Well, I'm paying him for this session. It is his job. If, if uh, he, doesn't, he, do, he doesn't like me, you won't tell me. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is her prediction. Yeah. But in the waiting room, since she's predicting that I was so happy that it's over, Okay, so I will run, you know, it says, it's over, it's over, you know. <laughs> and then I spare times, extra time yeah. to ask her about her dress. Mm. And I even ask questions about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's when I discover a matching experience. I didn't know at the time. Okay. I didn't know at the time, but that's when I discovered unexpected, uh, unmatching experience. <laughs> that extraordinary that, 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 that probably the thing you would have never have guessed would be so important to her because it happened even outside the, the, the therapy time and it was just a spontaneous um, question that you were genuinely interested by. You weren't getting paid in the hour to, <laughs> to ask about this. But exactly so much to her because she could trust it i guess yeah. uh, exactly and i make jokes when i uh i tell that story it's in the book also i says well don't ask uh, every patient when you are in the waiting room this question or this question yeah. like you said it was it was something that came so spontaneously okay? there was no doubt in her in her mind mm. that i was interested in what was happening to her yeah okay and this is this. This was says this is crazy. <laughs> the first time he said this is crazy. I mean, all the hours I work hard <laughs> to change this. And so, and at that time I didn't know this thing about uh, unmatching experience and everything. But I never forget that experience. And when I, I discovered all the theory about uh, you know this unmatching experience and ju juxtaposition. And in this case, the juxtaposition would be the question I ask after. Okay, so she would have been surprised. This is the uh, you know the unmatching experience. She would have been surprised. Oh, he's asking me that question. Maybe he's interested. And then I ask other question about her dress and say, Oh yeah, he's really interested. Okay, this is the really the the, the way to uh, really change a, a role in the memory. So. Um... You know, just in terms of, you know, you know, thinking about other therapists and, and so on who might be watching this today, like what, what would your kind of message be around the experiential uh, side of therapy that you, you, you're, you're finding so enriching now? Um, what, what, what would you say about that? Well, I would say that uh, uh, the people like Damasio, Mark Solms, uh, Daniel Siegel, uh, and my personal experience makes me believe that uh, working with implicit memory needs some kind of experiential work <laughs> somewhere, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot have talk about, you know, like uh, Bruce Ecker called about experiential psychoeducation. Sometimes you can use words and images and things like that. It doesn't mean that 
people are doing uh, mental imagery all the time when I'm working and things like that. But the thing I want to make sure is that I, I feel the feeling, okay? That when even when the person is saying some uh, something to me that she's not like in imagery work or things like that, that I, I, I have a sense of her feeling about it, okay? In, in the sense that I need to feel that the implicit part is there too, not only language about it. Okay, and that that would be uh, that would be my message, uh, and then find ways to get there. And that ties in really with that sense of self as a feeling self, not just a kind of a, a set of thoughts or ideas about the self, like you're you're saying. I think at the start. Exactly, exactly. That's that's that that that's the the and. Uh, uh, that that's one thing I have, people who have seen me seen me work and sometimes they will say to me that you are very persistent in getting what people feel <laughs> like getting at what you know uh, what, what what's the basic uh, feeling about this and it's not and, and my my thing is not that the feeling you know at, I have known at one point in therapy it was like saying your feeling was the therapy, you know, like a feeling therapy, which is not true from my perspective, okay? It's not, feelings are markers of what is important for you. So you use feeling in terms of knowing what's important for the person, either, either in terms of what she wants and what she fears or avoids or things like that, okay? So if you avoid something, it's because you're, there's a fear, Okay, or something like that. Uh, if you want something, it's because it's something that goes, you, you hope, with needs, profound needs, and things like that. But how do you know that? Okay, <laughs> you have to get to feelings. It's, uh, so sometimes I give, I always searching for metaphor. I say to people, if, they, if you are offered a, a, a piece of a cake, you know, and one is cherry cake, cake and the other one is banana cake, okay? And people ask you, what, which one do you want? Okay? You could say something like, oh, uh, which one has more calories or things like that? Okay, this kind of thing. This doesn't tell you which one you would like. OK, yeah. maybe you would like this one and you decide that there's too much calories and you take the other one, but you know that you would prefer this one. OK, yeah. this is the importance of emotion. Emotions are marker of what's important for you. This is another thing about experiential, the, the question about why it's important to be uh, use experiential. The change has to come from the patient, not from you. That's that's really interesting, like that, what you just said there about, it's not about what you kind of want to change in her. It's something else. It's, it's about helping her to become curious and begin to open up to her own experience, particularly the, the the dissonant parts, which are exactly very hard to begin to approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it seems to me. Um, so, so that's interesting because I suppose is it possible, Pierre, that sometimes the client exp could experience us as kind of the, another person who kind of doesn't accept them, kind of wants them to be different, to change. I don't think so because uh, I, I always if if somebody, for example, would come up with uh, um, um, an overt statement saying, I, I, have a, I had a patient like this. She said uh, she was very uh, coming from a, a, a very different culture and uh, she was very dependent on her parents. OK. And she was uh, she came she came in therapy mostly for uh, anxiety uh, uh, issues, which isn't surprising in the in the situation. OK. And we discovered that uh, she didn't want to grow up. Mm. Okay. And I stopped there. We had an overt statement. I don't want to grow up. Okay. I said, okay. <laughs> you don't want to grow up. <laughs> but when she says that, that's interesting because, eh, you know, there's something that, you know, comes up, you know, but there is some price that comes with it. Okay. OK, you have somewhere. It's like I say, sometimes I use another metaphor. It's uh, it's minestrone soup. I don't know anything about kitchen, but, uh, you know, cooking. But I use that. I says, 
if you put uh, the ingredient first, the tomatoes, and then I don't know other things, and like that. then another time you try another sense, etc. But every time you will get a minestrone soup. Okay. So if you don't change anything, I mean, your anxiety will stay. Mm. Okay. So if, if you're ready to live with your anxiety, Okay, and when I say that, I don't say that in a way, uh, you know, sarcastic or things like that. Never, you know, I'm always with the fact that somewhere you don't want to, want to grow up. Mm. I'm not going to tell you you have to grow up. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. And it's interesting because uh, when, when we were using that, uh, we were using overt statement. And very often she, she begins she, she began to fear the overstatement <laughs> because, because then there was some change coming in. Yeah. And then she became she began, you know, um, expecting not to do the, the I was asking, did you read it between the session? No, it's too dangerous. <laughs> we have to deal with that. <laughs> but in, in a way, I never told her, for example, you should read it, or I'm not happy that you didn't read it. I said, okay. So what do we do now? What do, you do? And I always try to, and I think it should be that way. It's your decision if you don't want to change, okay? Absolutely. But usually it's paradoxal. You know, it's, it's rare that somebody will tell me, uh, well, it's okay, well, it's over. I, I, I choose not to change or things like that, okay? Like you said, very often as a therapist, I'm, uh, I'm very looking for the dissonance in the thing, okay? And I jump pointing the dissonance. And this is a very important thing about, for me that I understood about implicit and explicit. If you put an explicit memory, uh, if you put the, uh, for example, working memory to dissonant, okay? Uh, view of the world, it doesn't work. You have to do something. You have to make a choice. Uh, uh, very often I use also the, 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 this metaphor of Santa Claus. I says, it's impossible to believe and not believe in Santa Claus. Okay. Yeah. Either you believe or you don't believe anymore. Children believe in Santa Claus. They're, they're, it, it's not a construct. I mean, it's a construction, but they're believing. Okay. But the day you don't believe, I, I, I say to people when they ask me, well, would, would it, could it come back? I said to people, Try to believe in Santa Claus again. Yeah. Try. Okay? It's funny, it's uh, just on a personal note, I remember when I found out Santa Claus wasn't real. I hope there's nobody too young watching this. I doubt there's too many people watching <laughs> I don't. I don't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I remember being like, I, I'd, I'd rather unknow that. I'd rather not, you know, at least for another year or two, could I just not know that? So I could enjoy the... the, the exactly. The, that, that's you interesting. You can't know it once you know it, sort of. Yeah, exactly. And so I, it's why when change is done on a schema, it's just impossible to come back. You know, it, it's, it's your perception is, is different. The world is different. Can I ask a question? Do you remember, Pierre, how you helped that client say that statement, uh, I don't want to grow up? Do you remember what kind of prompted her or him or her to to say that was it kind of um were you just asking them to sort of um kind of uh, articulate the oh uh, i do it like we do in uh, in coherence therapy never put words in her in her mouth okay so uh, i use imagery so what would happen imagine yourself uh, for example leaving home what happens mm -hmm. okay this is what we call uh, symptom deprivation right Okay, so what happens? And uh, and and then I, I let her go, and then I took I take notes. Okay, and then I just put that together and give it to her. It's her, it's her words. I never I didn't invent anything. I didn't uh, I don't push any vision. I don't tell her she should stop, uh, you know, living with her parents or things like that. Okay, and, and that, uh, that led to her then looking at all this and kind of realizing that the the, the 
the response was, I don't want to grow up. I don't want to. Exactly. I want to stay like I am. And uh, and even then we change a symptom at one point. I was very happy because it was, uh, she, she developed all kind of uh, compulsion because of her, her panicky and things like that. And and we change a, a thing. And, and she said to me, well, uh, that there was something that I, that, that she lost losing that compulsion, you know, it's like, because now I'm more grown up. <laughs> there was something about growing up. It's funny because in, in my culture, nobody would say something like so clearly, you know, people would use a kind of coherence, uh, <laughs> but she said it like just plainly and it was so amazing. Okay. Yeah. And she said, yes, it's like this. Yeah. She says, okay. As a matter of fact, she changed a lot. As a matter of fact, she's married now. She's pregnant. She will get a child pretty soon. And so she she, she has grown up somewhere. <laughs> really? Yeah, no, that sounds like brilliant work. Um, so um, we, we probably should start bringing today to a, a conclusion, I think. Um, if nothing, if for no other reason but the time. Um, Maybe you could say a little bit about the book you you've just um, written. Uh, just curious, will that will there be an English version of that coming out? Maybe you could say a little bit about that book that you've just uh, written with your colleague, um, if you like. Sophie Coté. Yeah. Well, it, it's um, it's it's uh, Sophie Coté and I have been trained by uh, Bruce Ecker and his team, and uh, and uh, but we gave workshop in French. But like everybody, we. We, we had our personal way of presenting coherence therapy. And uh, uh, so this particular way that we had of presenting coherence therapy, we decided to put it in a book. So it's, it's really a book about, it's mainly about the title is Memory Reconsolidation as executed in coherence therapy. But the main thing is Memory Reconsolidation because Memory Consolidation can be done by many kinds of therapies somewhere, mainly experiential though, <laughs> I can mention that. And uh, uh, somewhere, so the book is, is uh, like the first chapter is about memory because it is my dada, the memory, you know, like, uh, so you have to know how memory works so that where uh, we will tell you in the book how to go to these kind of memories. And so we, we give, um, uh, we give the, uh, also a, a chapter is about all the research done on memory reconsolidation. And then we, we give our own way of presenting coherence uh, therapy somewhere. And uh, Bruce Ecker has seen our uh, diagrams and everything and has given us the saying it's okay <laughs> in terms of, so it's, it, it's it, the difference is probably, people have told us it's very practical. Uh, we have a lot of example and things like that. So, and we are writing a second one about schema therapy and memory reconsolidation. So that this is, we, we will come, we will present schema therapy and then we say, how can we make sure that we go at changing schema and not just coping with schema? Uh, what would be little things to be uh, conscious of? You know, very often you can use a technique that you already have and just add a little perspective, especially about the, the prediction question, okay? Because everything has to do with prediction. <laughs> Okay, for example, uh, an example of using it, and if you use, for example, with panic attack, people use uh, uh, sensory desensitization, somatic sensory desens desensitization, okay, for example. And for example, we, uh, we just, uh, Sophie had an example, just adding uh, an overstatement before doing the exercise saying that I won't be able to stay with it, for example, okay? So you have your prediction. And if your experience is that you deal with it, okay, it's different than just dealing with it because now you have your prediction, yeah. okay, <laughs> and you have the experience that you're doing. And after that, you could say, well, you told that you couldn't deal with it. Yeah. And what happened? Right. Okay. You see, you see the way as I do it is really how we do it. We don't say, oh, you see, eh? you said you, you said you couldn't, you couldn't do it. You did it. That's good. Nice, nice person. 
that, that's a thing we learn a lot with uh, Bruce Hecker. Never take, you know, says, okay, so there's a part of you who says that you won't be able to do it. And now there's a part of you who says, okay. Yeah, so you're letting the person's own internal coherence uh, and, and dissonance all get, let, like, let that all sort of sort itself out. Exactly. Like the person. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting because once I was in Morocco giving a, a, a workshop and somebody asked me to, uh, out of the blue like this, to, to, if uh, she could play a patient with me, a patient she had. Okay. And uh, the situation, so we work with a situation with a woman that was somewhere between her husband and her mother and things like that, you know. Uh, so we work the situation and the way I intervene. There was a psychiatrist uh, in the in the audience who was another speaker in that conference, and he told me, and I loved it. He says, "What Pierre did is that he, he forced. I don't know in English if it's good. He he he, he put his brain in a in a, in a situation where she had to make choice. Mm. Okay. So, for example, I make the choice of not going up." <laughs> And I take all what comes with it. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Even if it's difficult. So if you have that dissonance thing, you 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 can you put the brain in some situation where Santa Claus exists or not. Okay. There's no in between <laughs> somewhere, and it's what you try to to bring the patient in that situation somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're kind of you're able to be that kind of a bit more neutral about it than kind of that's more ter therapeutic to be more neutral. And yeah, the, yeah. The client the time to sort through that themselves. Then, but I, I, it's like I'm not neutral about every part of the person. Okay, so, oh, there's this part of you. Okay, there's this part of you. <laughs> so I'm very empathic to each part. You know. Yeah, yeah. But I I don't take side. If you want neutral, I would say I don't take sides. You don't take sides. Yeah. 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 That's that's because I'm not neutral about the pain. I'm not neutral about, you know, uh, we, we say in coherence therapy that there is, um, you know, a, a big pain and a lower pain. Uh, the, the lower pain is, is the price you pay for your symptoms somewhere. It's sometimes it's very high, uh, high pain. Okay. But it's less worse than what you're pu putting away in your prediction. Okay. So there is pain on both sides somewhere. So it's like you are empathic to both pains, but you don't take side. That's yeah. that really. Yeah. Cause I was kind of thinking about that in terms of when we in, in, you know, encounter a client or, or a person who is clearly suffering from their defenses and their, their, you know those those really limited self self defeating kind of predictions. Mm -hmm. It's very it's sometimes it's hard not to be kind of really kind of you know activated by that and like wanting to help the person to to change or to see the the dilemma or to mm -hmm. uh, can be hard not to take sides. <laughs> you know, like I think. Oh, I have a side in my head. You know, yeah, that's true. <laughs> But it's it's like uh, I hope I do it well. Uh, I, I'm not uh, I, I'm not uh, sharing that you know that preference. So um, I think we we'll start to draw uh, this to a conclusion. Um, just want to say you know thank you so much, um, Pierre, for coming here today, and I've really enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> and uh, I think you know the viewers hopefully will will too. You know, um, and you know. Um, just, to, I suppose, like, yeah, just to say as well, you know, we, we may we may do a follow up at some stage if you're interested, uh, you know, maybe at some stage down the line, but we'll we'll see how we get on, you know, if you were open to that. Um, sure, sure. So it has been a pleasure. <laughs> it was a pleasure to uh, also to have that uh, exchange. And uh, it's always interesting to stop ourselves and have that kind of, you know, reflection about what we're doing and share with other people doing the same something like us, like we're doing. So. Yeah, I feel, I feel, I feel enriched. I feel, I feel good. <laughs> so, um, and I hope our viewers will 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 feel the same. So, um, such a, a shared experience. <laughs>